Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Marcia Mintz, the director of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. The center was founded in 2002 to contribute academic research and to convene experts from all walks, like our panel today, to inform debate and discussion at the nexus of business and public policy. The Georgetown on the Hill series is one of our activities, one of our favorites. And um, we'd like to thank our hosts for allowing us to gather in this space today. If you'd like more information on the center or if you'd like to see the recording of today's discussion, it will be posted on our website um, shortly. And you can pick up one of our bookmarks um, on your way out. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Brad Jensen, who will moderate today's discussion. Thanks, Marcia. <clears throat> so uh, thank you all for coming. I am uh, delighted to have such a distinguished panel uh, here to talk about um, the role of inward foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, recently, the, uh, the debate around globalization has focused on trade, and particularly trade in goods. Uh, often overlooked in this is the role of foreign direct investment, and particularly the role of inward foreign direct investment, where companies based outside the United States are making investments in the United States. So we have just a terrific panel uh, to discuss issues around the role of inward foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, I think their bios have been distributed, so I'll just make very brief introductions. To my left is uh, Lindsay Oldensky. She's a professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University a colleague of mine at Georgetown, and also a colleague of mine at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, where Lindsay is a senior fellow. Uh, prior to graduate school, Lindsay worked at both uh, the Treasury and at the, uh, the Boston Fed. Uh, to Lindsay's left is Nancy McLernan. Nancy is president and CEO of the Organization for International Investment. The Organization for International Investment is an association representing US subsidiaries of global companies. Prior to joining the Organization for International Investment, Nancy was Legislative Directive, Director for Trade Policy at Citizens for a Sound Economy. To Nancy's left is Nicholas Evans. Nicholas is Vice President for Government Rela Relations at CGI. CGI, which is based in Canada, is one of the largest IT and business process services providers in the world. Prior to joining CGI, Nicholas worked for Accenture. And last but not least, at the far end of the table is Aaron Ennis. Aaron is Senior Vice President at the US-China Business Council. Uh, the US-China Business Council provides extensive China-focused information advisory and advocacy services to US companies. Prior to joining uh, the US-China Business Council, Aaron worked at Kissinger McClarty Associates. So again, a, a terrific panel, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Okay. Well, thanks, Brad, um, and thanks to Brad and to the Center for inviting me to give this talk here today. Um, I've been doing research on foreign direct investment, including foreign direct investment into the U.S. for a number of years, and one of the conclusions that consistently comes out of looking at that data is that inward foreign direct investment in the U.S. has tremendous benefits for the U.S. economy in terms of creating high-paying jobs, in terms of infusions of capital, and in terms of uh, productivity growth. So, um, you know, in terms of the, the focus of the current administration, I, I did see that, that Wilbur Ross, uh, Secretary of Commerce, is going to be giving a talk, uh, headlining a select USA event um, encouraging foreign direct investment in the U.S., which suggests that the administration might have a sense of some of those benefits. But at the same time, we've been hearing a lot about restricting trade. And that's been through actions that have already been taken, such as the U.S. withdrawal from TPP and um, the increasing use of temporary trade barriers, uh, as well as things that, that haven't been implemented yet that have been discussed. So this includes punitive tariffs on countries like Mexico and China and uh, talk about renegotiating NAFTA. But because trade and foreign direct investment are so tightly linked, 
doing anything that could potentially restrict trade is also going to inf uh, have an effect on foreign direct investment, including foreign direct investment in the US. And that's because the firms that are doing this investing are very globally integrated. They rely a lot on global supply chains. And when you implement tariffs and other trade restrictions, it interrupts these global supply chains and affects the decisions of the firms that are already operating in the US and you know, increases the costs of firms that, that might be thinking about investing in the future. So I'll start by giving just a general overview of the current state of foreign direct investment globally. Uh, the US is the largest player in both inward and outward foreign direct investment and has been pretty much for uh, many years. So if you think about just inward foreign direct investment in 2015, the most recent year for which there's data, the US had almost $380 billion of new inward foreign direct investment uh, entering the economy. And that's more than twice as much as either of the next two economies, which were in that particular year, Hong Kong and China. Um, and then in terms of outward FDI, the US is also the greatest investor. The US firms do more outward investment in other countries than firms from anywhere else. And in, you know, again, in 2015, the US had about $300 billion worth of outward FDI. So you'll note that the US does more, well, they, they receive more inward foreign direct investment than they do in outward foreign direct investment. So as I said, US outward FDI was about 300 billion, but US inward FDI was about 380 billion in um, 2015. And you know, that, that's more than any other country. The other outward investors uh, include countries like Japan and China, which, which are generally the next two. And if you think just about foreign direct investment coming into the US, top source countries are, are generally other high income countries. We're talking about places like the UK, Japan, Germany, Switzerland, France, and Canada. China is not quite as high up on the list, but they're growing. I think Aaron will say some more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but, but these are generally where the investment is coming from in terms of sectors. Most of this investment is going into manufacturing. That's, that's the largest single major sector, followed by services and then wholesale and retail trade. But services is still a very large part of it. And within manufacturing, important areas are automobiles, pharmaceuticals, uh, motor vehicles, chemicals, petroleum and coal products, and computers and electronics, followed by food. And um, with services, we're talking about things mostly like finance, banking, insurance, but also administrative and support services and hotels and restaurants. And as you might expect, along with all of this inward foreign direct investment comes jobs. So in 2014, 6.6 .6 million Americans were employed by foreign firms in the US. And I mentioned manufacturing is, is the largest single sector. Well, in manufacturing alone, uh, more than 20% of US manufacturing workers are employed by foreign firms in the US. So, so I'll say that again. Of, of all US manufacturing workers, and we hear a lot about manufacturing workers these days, um, about 20% of them are employed by firms, foreign firms that have invested in the US. So foreign direct investment is a very important component of um, domestic US employment, particularly in, in manufacturing. And these firms aren't just creating any old jobs, right? They're, they're creating good jobs, very high paying jobs. Uh, and you know, average wages and benefits played by these firms are you know, roughly about 20% greater than the average wage paid by the average US firm. And this is universal across industries. Um, so, you know, wh why is this? Why are they paying higher wages? Well, think about why they're in the U.S. Firms are not attracted to the U.S. because we have low wages. I mean, that's, that's obvious. That's, that's not the case at all. They're here either to access the U.S. market, uh, to be close to, to customers, but also to take advantage of high-skilled workers in the U.S. who can perform complex, non-routine tasks and uh, can do things like research and in development. And so, you know, there, there could be uh, within this, these industries, um, there could be some occupational composition that could explain some of the wage premium, but there's likely also a, a firm component, right? So think about which firms are investing in the U.S. You know, investing in the U.S., investing anywhere internationally is costly. It's extremely difficult. You have to do a lot of research. You have to learn a lot, have a lot of hurdles to get over before you can do it, not to mention the cost of the actual physical investment. 
So we're not talking about the average firm from, say, Germany or, or the average firm from China or something like that. We're talking about exceptional firms. We're talking about the most productive firms from these countries. They're the ones that are able to invest in the U.S., and we've seen from work that, that Brad has done and that others have done that more productive firms pay higher wages, and, and that's what we're seeing with foreign firms that are investing in the U.S., and um, you know these are some of the direct effects, right? We think about you know this is actually the capital that comes into the U.S. and there's also these this employment, but there's also more indirect effects that happen uh, through what's known as spillovers of foreign direct investment. So you know foreign firms they enter a new country, they bring with them their own technologies, their own management practices, their their general know-how, and that that can spill over, that can transfer to domestic firms. And this can happen through what's known as horizontal spillovers. So, for example, an employee might work for a foreign firm, and then you know they'll leave and, and take a job at a domestic firm, and they'll, they'll bring their know-how, the things they learned with them. Or you can have vertical spillovers. So you know, suppose you have a firm that invests in the US, and they want to get their inputs from local suppliers. They might share their technology with those firms. And, and these spillovers are very important. There have been, you know, a lot of people have done research on this, but uh, for example, a recent project I did for the Peterson Institute with, with my colleague uh, Ted Moran found that, you know, of all the total productivity growth in the U.S. in the 90s and early 2000s, about 10% of it could be directly attributed to these productivity spillovers that came from foreign direct investment in the U.S. Um, so that's another important channel. And as I mentioned, you know, foreign firms in the U.S. are very globally connected. They rely a lot on global supply chains. Uh, so we can see this in, in 2014, uh, the most recent year for which we have this data. Foreign firms in the U.S. had $434 billion of exports. Uh, these are exports leaving the U.S. And they also had $735 billion in imports. So they're clearly very integrated in global supply chains. So if you were to place uh, tariffs on these imports, that, that's going to be a huge cost for these very globally connected firms that are operating in the U.S. And you know that could, in, in some cases, you know when you when you see these additional costs, lead firms to perhaps scale down, or it could be a disincentive for new firms that are considering investing in the U.S. And on the flip side, if you have trade expansion, that can lead to increases in FDI. Uh, so for example, recent estimates by Peter Petrie and Michael Plummer of uh, the Peterson Institute found that TPP, if, if it had actually gone through, um, would have increased FDI in the U.S. by $128 billion through uh, the year 2030. So th that's you know tremendous gains that from FDI coming out of you know what's essentially a trade agreement. Um, so you know why are there debate? Why is there debate about this, right? If, if there's so many gains, then you know why do people just discuss or debate um, inward FDI? And uh, first of all, there are some concerns about national security threats. Some people bring up th these risks and these issues. And there are cases where national security um, certainly is a legitimate concern. Um, however, as I mentioned, most of the foreign direct investment coming into the US comes from places like the UK, Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia, uh, places where the US has uh, pretty good relationships where we're not necessarily worried about security risks. And much of it is in industries that are not sensitive from a security perspective. Uh, so for most FDI coming to the US, it's, it's not really an issue. And then for the cases where there are legitimate reasons to have concerns, we have CFIUS, the, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, who will look at those on a case-by-case -case basis and, and can block investments if, if there is indeed an issue. Um, and then another concern is exactly the opposite, which is that there's not enough foreign direct investment in the US. And that, that's in part based on perceptions by firms from other countries. Um, you know, about the CFIUS process, sometimes based on misinformation or misunderstanding of how that works or how difficult that might be to navigate. Uh, the, U the U.S. is also a very complicated place if you're a firm looking to invest. And I don't know if anyone else on, on the panel will talk about this. We can go into more detail if, uh, if people would like during discussion. But, you know, we have 50 different states with different laws, uh, different tax policies. Some are right to work, some are not. Uh, they have very different comparative advantages. So it, it, it's very difficult to navigate. There's a lot of informational hurdles to get over if you're a firm investing in the U.S. And we have Select USA at the Department of Commerce, 
which exists to, to help firms investing in the U.S., but uh, as a federal government agency, they can't, um, you know, advance one state over another or pr privilege one geographic location over another. And so they're, they're kind of limited in what they can do in terms of helping firms um, that are looking for, for specific information or specific advice on where to invest in the U.S. And as I mentioned, um, uncertainty about the future trade environment or potential trade barriers can also be a huge barrier to foreign direct investment. So just to, to wrap up my very brief comments here, um, there are many benefits to the U.S. to being open towards inward foreign direct investment. And moving forward, it's important to really keep these benefits in mind, but also to watch out for unintended consequences of trade restrictions, which are going to have huge effects on inward FDI and then potentially jeopardize all the benefits that come with inward FDI. Great. Uh, I'll agree with everything <laughs> that you said, Lindsay. Uh, and thank you, Brad, for including me and, and Bob as well. I am so thrilled that you all are having this session on foreign direct investment, and we didn't even tee it up, right? So as, as Brad said, I mean, there is so much conversation right now about trade and global connections, and foreign direct investment into the U.S. is often our blind spot in international policy. And yet the value of cross-border investment really rivals that of the value of trade of goods and services. So I applaud you for, for holding this uh, today. So as you mentioned earlier, my group, the Organization for International Investment, is an association of U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies like, like Nicholas's. Uh, we represent companies from all over the world that have made this deliberate decision to invest in the U.S. and employ people here. Companies like Nestle, which is Swiss, Siemens, which is German, uh, Airbus, which is uh, French, uh, Samsung, which is Korean. All of these companies from around the world, not to serve our market, for sure, because the U.S. obviously is the largest market. They're here for that. But they're also here as a platform for exports, given certain technologies in the United States. I'm not sure, Lindsay, if you mentioned that U.S. workers at foreign companies manufacture about 26% of all of our exports. And so that is pretty counterintuitive, that these companies are coming here not just to serve our market, but as an export platform. So our organization started 26 years ago, and I was there at the beginning. So I've been doing foreign direct investment for over a quarter of a century. Um, and uh, we started because there was a lot of Japanese investment in the U.S. at the time, sort of ramping up, and policymakers were becoming really concerned and skeptical about global connections, foreign investment, whether it was an acquisition or a greenfield investment. And you know, fast forward 26 years um, after sort of a, a pretty upward climb of people understanding the benefits of globalization, we're now back at a point where I think that there is skepticism. And teasing out all the different attributes of a global economy is critically important. Um, you know, as I mentioned, when a global company headquartered in another country makes this deliberate decision to invest here, there's no greater sign of our competitiveness worldwide because they're not a homegrown firm. They didn't just start up here, right? So it is a sign uh, of our competitiveness. And despite us being the number one location around the world, we've actually lost ground. UNCTAD does some numbers that looks at the worldwide share of global investment. And in 2000, the U.S. attracted about 37% of the world's investment. And as of uh, last year, no, I think 2015 is the latest year available, we attracted 22%. So our annual flows, which go up and down depending on uh, a transaction here or there, um, can be very volatile. But, but our share has shrunk. Over the last few years, actually, we started growing because in 2008, we had dropped to about 15%. So we're on the, uh, the incline again, but the U.S. should never take for granted that foreign companies will come and set up shop here. Um, but in fact, foreign investment really is not that foreign at all. Uh, all of us rely on the products and services that global investment in the U.S. provides. And thanks to global investment, these products are being made in the United States. So for those of you who took uh, any of the new D.C. Metro uh, cars. They were produced by Kawasaki from Japan. Um, your, your kids go to school on Thomas-built 
School Buses, which is owned by Daimler, which is a German company. Um, the news and information we get, LexisNexis is a UK company. Reuters is a Canadian company. Your phone, even if it's an iPhone, has products in it that were developed by Samsung in the United States. Uh, the apps on your phone were developed by Nokia, which is a Finnish company. And even your first cup of coffee in the morning is brought to you by U.S. workers at German companies from Caribou Coffee to Pete's Coffee. So it's, it's really in so many aspects of the U.S. economy. And this is not just about the products they produce. This is about the impact on the jobs and the workforce. Um, I know that Representative Byrne uh, from Mobile, Alabama, was uh, hosted us today and got this room. In Alabama alone, over the past five years, employment at U.S. subsidiaries has grown by 19 percent, when the state's overall private sector employment grew by only 3 percent. So, you know, the comparison there is pretty stark. Uh, and more than 60 percent of all the jobs at U.S. subsidiaries in Alabama are in the manufacturing sector. And the compensation that manufacturing workers make at, uh, at these global firms in Alabama earn nearly double the state's overall private sector wage. The, the wage there at the manufacturing U.S. subsidiaries is over $69,000 a year in Mobile, Alabama. So that's pretty cool. Some of the prominent members of our organization that are in Alabama are Honda, Daimler, Hyundai, and Michelin. All of these companies making a deliberate decision to invest and uh, employ uh, Americans. Thinking about the issues and the environment that we're in today, how can the U.S. sort of attract investment? What are the issues that our organization, which is devoted to making the United States the most competitive location around the world for foreign investment, what are the issues that, that our organization and our companies care about in this space? First of all, prioritizing foreign direct investment in our economic agenda. Again, we always focus on the trade of goods and services to a less extent, but not enough uh, on inbound investment. This administration seems to have prioritized Select USA. Uh, the first political appointee that uh, Secretary Ross made was the head of Select USA, which is the federal agency, as Lindsay mentioned, set up to, be, to promote foreign investment in the United States. I also sit on the Secretary's Investment Advisory Council, um, and uh, which Secretary Pritzker appointed me to last year, which is made up of foreign companies in the United States, um, associations and economic development offices around the U.S., and we've already held a meeting this year. So there are some positive signs uh, that this administration understand the benefits of foreign investment. And President Trump even tweeted about a few of our companies in a positive way earlier in the year. Um, so, uh, so, so that was a sense, hopefully, of understanding the benefits that, that FDI can bring. But as Lindsay said, those global connections are imperative, right? These companies cannot operate in countries that want to isolate itself from the rest of the world. So besides prioritizing FDI as an economic priority, we need to prioritize our tax treaties and our trade agreements. And both tax treaties and trade agreements are enormously important. Any company that operates in multiple jurisdictions need to have rules of the road. And without those, the U.S. Uh, certainly will, will fall behind on a, being competitive for FDI. One of my member companies um, was looking to put uh, a factory to make cars in the United States. And they were considering the U.S. and Mexico. And one of the top reasons they actually chose Mexico is Mexico has far more trade agreements with, uh, with other countries than the U.S. does. Um, so the importance of trade agreements is right up there. A little bit about tax reform. So right now, within the tax reform debate, there is a lot of discussion about you know, increasing our competitiveness. Our tax code needs to be changed to increase our competitiveness. Well, part of that competitiveness needs to include uh, competitiveness for non-homegrown companies that are here not just U.S. firms, which of course are important. Um, and there have been some provisions over the course of time and even in the current debate that I am happy to get into for any tax nerds in the room that would disproportionately impact foreign-owned companies in the United States. Um, another issue in, in the tax space are rules that were passed last year um, in the waning days of the Obama administration. Has anybody heard of a corporate inversion? Raise your hand. Have you heard of a corporate inversion? Right? 
Doug has. Um, so a corporate inversion, there was a lot of press on this last year. It's when a U.S. company acquires a smaller foreign company and then moves its global headquarters outside of the United States to escape our very uncompetitive tax code because the U.S. taxes worldwide income where other countries, for the most part, only tax what's earned in that country. And under the politics of inversions, the administration rolled out regulations that I'll refer to as Section 385, that's the most numbers I'll cite in the code, um, that are really debt equity rules and uniquely and disproportionately impact foreign-owned companies. And in the final regulations, it said, we recognize this will increase the effective tax on foreign companies in the U.S. and make the U.S. less competitive for foreign investment, right? And so at the end of the day, you know, we need to connect the dots across our policies to ensure that if we have Select USA working to bring foreign investment in, and then we have the Treasury Department saying that these policies will make the U.S. less competitive for foreign direct investment, there is certainly a disconnect. Um, uh, trade agreements, as we as we mentioned, uh, definitely very important. We understand that NAFTA is going to be modernized. Let's make sure that we um, uh, take a look at it also for being competitive for inward investment. Uh, government contracting to ensure that foreign companies in the United States that meet the variety of different rules about government contracting can, can play on a level playing field. Um, also want to protect the mission of CFIUS. Lindsay mentioned the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. That is the federal government's review process for looking at foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies when there is national security um, implications. It's uh, a rule that has been um, tightened in the past. We want to ensure that, of course, first and foremost, our national security is protected. But we also want to ensure that we remain open and that uh, competitors don't use the CFIUS process to achieve something that they couldn't in the marketplace. So as an organization, we want to ensure that CFIUS stays focused on national security and that there's no uh, mission creep and that we try to keep the politicization down, uh, down to a low roar on that, which can be difficult at times. Um, and I'll just mention, finally, um, state level. We talked about the complexities of investing in the United States. Um, states uh, provide a lot of issues that can be problematic for inbound investment because states, due to state sovereignty, don't have to adhere to the obligations of our tax and trade, uh, our tax treaties and our trade agreements. And so educating state level policymakers on the importance to their economy of adhering to those international obligations has been something that we've worked a lot on and have had great success on. Um, because as states recognize that in order to be competitive for foreign direct investment, they need to adhere to those international obligations, um, they actually end up making, uh, more often than not, the right choices. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Nicholas. Great. Thank you very much. Great to be with all of you today. I appreciate the opportunity to be, uh, to be a part of the panel. Um, so my name is Nicholas Evans. I work for a company called CGI, not the Clinton Global Initiative, not <laughs> Not the cool computer graphics company, um, so sorry to disappoint right, right out of the shoot, but uh, we are a very large IT consulting firm and systems integrator. We have almost 70,000 people worldwide. About 11,000 of those are here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll take a bit of a different um, spin on things from, from what you'll hear you know, perhaps from, from some of the other panelists and talk a little bit about what my company's been doing over the last decade or 11 or 12 years um, to, with, a, with a new type of uh, foreign direct investment for our industry aimed at both supporting our uh, clients around the globe um, and also trying to revitalize communities in rural and small towns, uh, rural America and small town America across the country. Um, you know, the work that we do um, the, for, for a lot of our clients is we develop and maintain software applications for them. So if you think of uh, any large uh, institution, be it a bank, an insurance company, a telecommunications company, 
uh, energy company, they have um, large IT systems and a lot of uh, IT applications that they're utilizing every day, whether it's the tools that their employees use to communicate or tools that they use to manage their supply chain or it's tools that they use to communicate with customers, uh, what, whatever it might be. And a lot of that work uh, ends up being um, done by companies like mine that, that have expertise in it. And traditionally, this is the type of work that was done in major metropolitan areas um, across the U.S., and still a lot of, a lot of it is, um, be it in uh, Washington, D.C., New York City, Silicon Valley, Atlanta, wherever it might be. And over the last, I, you know, I'd say quarter century, maybe a little bit longer, you increasingly had this type of work um, for corporate clients move to offshore locations, uh, India, Philippines, other places like that, and you know, no secret as to why, a skilled workforce um, over there uh, for significantly lower cost. And truth in advertising, we absolutely have operations in, in those countries and support some of our global clients uh, from those locations. However, we started to get a sense from some of our clients here in the U.S. Um, that they were experiencing a little bit of fatigue with um, all of that work going offshore, and they wanted to have the operations closer to them. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, I mean, it's no secret uh, the vast amount of, of foreign direct investment is here because of wanting access to this market. It's the largest market in the world. Um, and we had some clients that, that, uh, that seemed to be looking for something different. At the same time, they couldn't really afford to go back to their old model, uh, where they just did everything in Washington, D.C. or New York City. And so actually it was Mark Warner, um, when he was governor, who had the idea that he really wanted to have some technology-led economic development in southwest Virginia, uh, Russell County, um, coal country. Uh, he was very eager on, on seeing some of that happen, and he reached out to our company and a number of other ones, and we uh, said yes, and we, it was a bit of a leap of faith for us um, that we would put a software development facility. I've got nothing against call centers, but this is not a call center. Th this is a facility where we've got people that have serious uh, software development skills. Uh, we said we would put one in Lebanon, Virginia, and that we would create 300 jobs there. Um, fast forward 11 years, and we're still there, and we have almost 400 people there. Um, the model worked. Uh, we, we got some traction. We were able to, we had clients who were interested in it. We were able to partner with uh, local two-year and four-year academic institutions to develop curriculum so that we could ensure the, the pipeline of talent, uh, the skilled workforce that we, were need, that we were going to need. We had broadband, which um, as you're thinking about infrastructure, that is absolute table stakes um, for us and just about any uh, large organization that, that's looking to invest. Uh, in, a, in a rural part of the country. Um, and we had some maker clients who were, who, who were interested in doing this. And so after a couple of years, we thought, well, this is something that we'd like to try and replicate. Uh, and so the next one was in Troy, Alabama. I'm hopeful we're part of that 19%, was it, Troy, Alabama? Because I know that we have um, over 400 people now uh, in Troy, Alabama. And we're actually co-located with Troy University. Uh, so we did that one. We then moved on to Texas and Belton, Texas, uh, which is very close to Fort Hood. And the focus of that investment is around hiring veterans and members of military families. They make up about 50% of our workforce there. Um, Lafayette, Louisiana, Wausau, Wisconsin, Waterville, Maine, same, same type of story. And we're looking for more opportunities to, to do similar types of investment. We now have more than 10% of our workforce is working in one of these centers that's outside of a major metropolitan area, um, providing high quality service to our clients. Um, and we feel um, revitalizing some of these communities. Lebanon, for example, they've done studies that it leads to uh, an additional seventy million dollars in um, in economic activity. Um, just the fact that just the fact that we're there. Um, and I I would second a number of things that have been said um, by Lindsay and by Nancy talking about Select USA. I will be there. I think I probably have last count, maybe a dozen meetings set up with various local uh, economic development organizations to learn more about what they're doing, um, to the point that was made about the, um, my term, not yours, the sort of patchwork quilt of states and, and having to, you know, to navigate that. I mean, we basically put a, set up a model um, that, that allowed us to accelerate some of those early conversations and come to the table um, with a very clear sense uh, of, of what we're looking for. But I, I tend to think that this is, um, you know, this focus, again, I, I, I have seen some encouraging signs from the administration around making foreign direct investment a priority. Um, I think that this is a time for companies to look beyond their physical supply chains uh, and also look at their information supply chains and think about 
where they're having their IT work done. I have nothing against work that's, um, that's done offshore. Um, again, we do that for some of our clients. It's whatever model makes the most sense, but I have to believe that there are companies out there that are taking a look at uh, at where it is they, they have all of their operations, and this is an area that they might not be thinking about as much as they're thinking about um, you know, where they're going to put a manufacturing plant. And um, I, Again, I have nothing against manufacturing jobs. I'm all for getting as many of those um, developed here and around the world, um, but I think it's important to remember that you can do what you want with trade policy. You can do what you want with immigration policy. Automation continues. And that is going to continue to disrupt the traditional uh, manufacturing model. Uh, and in, in my mind, only further underscore the importance of having a strong new economy workforce, not just in Silicon Valley and on the East Coast, but truly across the country. Uh, and so we're just uh, we're, we're hopeful that we can continue to be a part of that, and that um, you know, a, as government is looking at uh, you know ways to spur growth. They're cognizant of uh, new economy infrastructure in terms of broadband and new economy job growth in terms of uh, IT services uh, across the country. So that was my two cents, and I'll pass it on. So um, Aaron Ennis, I'm from the U.S. China Business Council. Um, we represent about 200 U.S. companies that do business in China which may make you wonder why I'm going to be talking about Chinese investment in the U.S., but it is relevant. Um, I want to give you a few data points just to put all of this in context, and then I want to give you some um, perspective on some of the policy considerations that are happening in the United States surrounding Chinese investment here specifically, and then talk a little bit about um, an agreement that's been under negotiation for, I think, eight years at this point, maybe into year nine at this point, a bilateral investment treaty between the U.S. and China. So on the data front, um, I would commend to you a couple of reports that my counterparts at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relation have done with Rhodium Group and others um, quantifying Chinese investment in the U.S. Um, the data is, when you look at the raw numbers, probably wouldn't be that compelling to you. It was about $46 billion uh, worth of investment last year, which was three times the amount of the previous year. But given that China is the second largest economy in the world, that's actually a comparatively small amount of foreign investment. There are some reasons for that. Um, they're starting from a pretty small base. Um, you know, the basics of math are such that your growth rate, um, when you have a small amount and you double it, um, the numbers look impressive, at least on a percentage basis, but the volume actually isn't quite high. But we are, it's getting larger. Um, I think the important thing to note, and actually it's a point that I think Lindsay had made, that for certain countries, um, those numbers for foreign investment in the U.S. can be significantly moved by one large transaction in any given year or the absence of one large transaction. So two or three years ago, there appeared to be a significant spike in Chinese investment in the U.S. It was almost entirely driven by the acquisition of Smithfield Foods. Last year, we had a pretty significant spike in investment in real estate and hospitality, largely driven by investments by H&A Corporation and buying some hotel chains around the United States. Now, none of that makes any of this unimportant. It still um, creates jobs around the United States. Um, the largest sectors we're seeing right now for Chinese investment in the U.S. are real estate and hospitality, um, consumer products, um, technology, transportation infrastructure, and media and entertainment. Each of those, again, driven in, in large part right now by a handful of companies in each of those sectors who, as Lindsay pointed out, have the capability to be able to invest overseas and see targets in the United States that they're interested in. And again, let me, let me emphasize that point. They see targets in the U.S. Most of this investment right now, from Chinese companies at least, is coming through mergers and acquisition rather than through greenfield investment. Now, there has been some shift of that in recent years towards some greenfield investment. Um, some of that may be driven by U.S. trade policy. Um, we've seen a variety of auto parts manufacturers and other companies that may be subject to anti-dumping or countervailing duties invest here. When you produce a product in the United States, you aren't subject to ADCVD since your product is never crossing a border. It's um, probably largely being sold to a U.S. customer here. But in general, the U.S. is an attractive market for many companies, and accessing U.S. companies is important. And as wages in China have gone up and the cost of doing business in China has gone up, 
markets like the United States have become much more important. So right now, um, the estimates that Rodian Group has put out is that there's about 3,200 Chinese-owned companies in the United States. That's up from about 1,900 at the end of 2015. Most congressional districts have at least one Chinese company doing business there. And employment right now is pretty modest, but not insignificant. About 140,000 Americans work for Chinese companies in the US at this point. So in thinking about the policy challenges about Chinese investment in the US, I think it's important to note one that does nothing to do with the US, and that is Chinese capital controls. China's economy has been slowing for probably the last four or five years. Um, it still grows at a pretty rapid clip compared to the US. We grow at about maybe 3% a year. China's economy will probably grow in the mid 6% this year. Um, but still at the same time, as that slowing of growth is happening, um, China's government has become very sensitive to capital flight. So the idea that if China is becoming a less attractive market, are people going to move their money offshore into a market where they're going to be getting a higher rate of return. And one way that a government can try to control some of that is to tell you that you just can't move your money out of the country. And China's capital controls have had some impact on the ability of foreign companies to get their money out to do their own investment, but also on Chinese companies in direct, uh, directly who are interested in investing overseas. For a Chinese company to move the amount of capital that you need to do an investment overseas, it's not just a matter of whether it's legal to move the money across the border or not. The government also has to approve that transaction. That's led over the course of the last 10 years or so to some missed opportunities for Chinese companies that were interested in investing overseas. My hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana had a General uh, Motors facility that had closed probably about 15, 20 years ago. And about 10 years ago, uh, a Chinese company was interested in acquiring part of the, the auto plant in Shreveport and potentially um, doing production there. But the cars that were made at the Shreveport plant tended to be very large trucks, um, civilian Hummers, those kinds of things. And the government determined that really wasn't where they wanted to be promoting investment overseas um, because it were, they were viewed as being less environmentally friendly than where the government wanted to see investment going. At the same time, the um, investments that have been coming here in the past few years, um, some have also been held up by those capital controls recently. Um, there, one of the higher profile potential acquisitions last year was an attempt by a company called Dalian Wanda to purchase Dick Clark Industries. Um, this is one that, you know, kind of setting aside what the other policy considerations might be, um, the Chinese government apparently had concerns about um, the amount of capital that it would take to buy that and um, halted the, the transaction. So that domestic consideration can have a significant influence over how many Chinese companies invest in the US, what the types of investments are that they are doing. So all important factors. To the points that have been made by, uh, by my colleagues already, I will just also note that the US policy environment certainly has an influence on that as well. Um, CFIUS rules are particularly important. Um, because so much of that of the investment that's coming here is done through mergers and acquisitions. Now, um, as Nancy pointed out, CFIUS reviews are supposed to be based on national security. Um, many Chinese companies, um, either out of uh, an overabundance of caution that their transaction um, can't be unwound later on, or um, out of um, a, somewhat of a disagreement over what is required to get a foreign investment approval in the United States. Sometimes seek CFIUS approval, even if it, you don't see necessarily a national security angle to it. Um, to that one, I will just note that when Dalian Wanda bought AMC movie theaters a few years ago, they sought CFIUS approval for it. Now, th theoretically, there was a movie theater that was near a US military installation or something, but in general, I think we probably would think that movie theaters probably aren't a national security concern. But many, many Chinese companies do seek CFIUS approval of it. Um, the numbers that the Treasury Department puts out tend to um, be a little bit um, out of sync with what we see in real time because the report from Treasury has a year delay. So the report that we got in, I believe it was February of this year, on foreign investment in the United States and CFIUS approvals was actually reflecting 2015 data. 
But even in looking at that data, you can see a significant increase in the number of Chinese companies seeking approval, a pretty wide variety of sectors that they're looking at, and a mixed bag on whether they're approved or not. So whether there is um, a national concert, security concern about all of these transactions certainly is um, open for discussion, but I think it's important to keep in mind that that it, there are those implications for some of those sectors. Um, I also want to note, though, that what we view as a concern about Chinese investment in the United States in Washington isn't necessarily the same of what um, our counterparts in a state or a local government might think of our concerns about a foreign investment. In general, mayors and governors are incredibly interested in having all types of foreign investment come in, um, and so are very eager to have Chinese investment. My suspicion will be at the Select USA conference in a few weeks, the Chinese are going to have a pretty good delegation here, and there's going to be a lot of folks eager to talk to them about having their companies invest in the area. So just keep in mind that where while we can probably have a pretty robust discussion about why foreign investment needs to be reviewed on legitimate national security bases. Um, probably the specific points about why we need to be moderated in those views um, would probably be articulated by your counterparts at the state and local level. I would say that there's also some potential challenges on the horizon. Nancy mentioned that CFIUS reforms are periodically under discussion. What that looks like and whether it is country neutral, that is, um, are the reforms that are made blind to whether the foreign investor coming into the United States is Chinese or German or British? Um, or are they done on the specific basis of countries that we may feel that are not as closely allied with us? That could have a significant impact for obvious reasons on Chinese investment, but it could also have a significant impact just generally in how the U.S. Um, is viewed as a foreign investment market. There's also been some discussion in Washington in recent months about potential for using reciprocity as a basis to consider um, both investment and trade more generally. The U.S. has possibly, well, I guess Singapore would be this other, but one of the most open investment environments for foreign investment in the world. And in general, we have very low tariffs and we are very open to all kinds of international trade. China is not the worst on the global scale. They certainly have higher tariffs in certain sectors. Um, they definitely have many more investment restrictions in certain sectors, particularly services. Um, but if we were to move to a reciprocity standard of how we treat trade with China in particular, you'd not only see an impact on how much Chinese investment comes here, but you probably would see some, some significant changes in terms of how the general flow of goods and services happens across borders. That may be worthwhile. I mean, if, if we choose as a country to take that approach in trying to get out new concessions for American companies that are doing business in markets overseas like China or Mexico or elsewhere, and that is our national policy, then, then that is what it is. But um, I guess I would encourage you all as your members think through these issues just to keep in mind that there are some things that we might gain from that, but also some potential consequences of that. And so what's most important in making any of those types of policy changes is to make sure that you've weighed all of the pros and cons before you decide on what the right direction should be. Let me briefly touch on, on the bilateral investment treaty negotiations with China, just because I think they have some relevance to that context of reciprocity. Um, the good news is that a bilateral investment treaty is exactly what it sounds like. It's bilateral, so it would just be between the United States and China. It deals with only investment, so it's not like the Trans-Pacific Partnership where it would deal with trade and goods and services or anything. It really deals with um, investment by a company from the United States or China in the alternative market. And it's a treaty. So for those of you who are House uh, staff people, I will just tell you, sorry, this is not one you'd get to vote on. The Senate gets to vote on treaties, um, and a bit is approved only through the Senate. The negotiations have been going on for about eight years, and I think there's a, a couple of important things to keep in mind about it. Why it's relevant to the US, it's, it's those investment restrictions that China maintains in certain sectors. In general, when China joined the World Trade Organization, it opened up manufacturing to 100% foreign investment. So most sectors in China allow 100% ownership of a facility. There's some notable exceptions, autos being uh, the one that probably everybody knows about. 
Um, but they maintained a number of restrictions on investment in the services sector, which is, of course, the largest portion of the U.S. economy. And most sectors of China, in the services sector in China, do maintain pretty significant investment restrictions. So for um, financial services firms like um, insurers or banks or securities firms, they're capped at the highest at 50% for insurance companies and the lowest for securities firms, I believe they're at 33% at this point. Um, for companies that do business in, um, in um, electronic commerce or other areas, there are also restrictions on how foreign companies can operate in the market. So what a bit would do at its core is address some of those by requiring China to open up the sectors, all subject to negotiation. So what we ultimately got would be a little bit of a trade-off, um, and we probably wouldn't get everything. But these are sectors that, in general, haven't seen significant changes in foreign investment restrictions since China joined the World Trade Organization about 15 years ago. So it would be meaningful for companies in those sectors. Um, that kind of a treaty would be important not only to US companies that are investing in China, but for all of the reasons that we've talked about already, it would be important to the US economy because it means more company, more Chinese companies coming here to invest. Again, in general, we don't restrict where foreign companies can invest, so there'd be a lot more potential. We'd be giving up very little for it. Uh, probably the two main gains that Chinese companies would get from a bilateral investment treaty with the United States is They'd have access to dispute settlement when something went wrong with an investment, but they'd also have essentially just better certainty that their investment would be treated on an equal basis with other foreign investments in the US. And the other benefit to the United States that we haven't talked about quite as much is that when US companies invest overseas, they do create more jobs here at home. I believe Justine touched on it, but let me just kind of point out that these, again, these companies tend to pay higher wages, they tend to export more, um, so that kind of residual benefit from a bilateral investment treaty could be very significant to the United States, both for direct and indirect purposes. And I will stop there. Great. Let me just pile on on that <clears throat> last point with regard to U.S. service firms and their access to China. The United States has some of the most globally competitive service firms, yet we don't export much to China. And that's because a lot of, for a lot of services, you need to have an office in the country. You know, a lot of it is done here, but you need a shop front. You know, you need insurance brokers, you need a retail banking outlet, or you need consultants in China. And these prohibitions on foreign direct investment in the service sector in China are very high. Work by the OECD shows that the barriers to services trade that China maintains are very high relative to the rest of the world. And almost all of it is in uh, prohibitions on foreign direct investment. If you take away the prohibitions on foreign direct investment, China's barriers to services trade look like about the OECD average. So this could be a huge win, this bilateral investment treaty, for US service firms. And I, I know that the, the current rage is to talk about manufacturing firms, but just remember, you know, manufacturing accounts for about 8% of the U.S. labor force. Okay, so it's service firms that are the future. U.S. service firms are globally competitive, and a bit with China would provide a lot of access to U.S. service firms. So sorry for getting on a hobby horse. Um, you can join me. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're open for questions. Yes. It, yeah. And if you'd identify yourself and your organization. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Brad. Tim Bennett, uh, Transatlantic Business Council. Uh, I'll start with two things. Um, hire American, buy, buy American. Uh, impact on foreign investment that any of you might be seeing. Also, uh, uh, inadequate supply of skilled labor in certain sectors. Uh, impact uh, that perhaps, Nancy, you're seeing among your members or others are seeing in terms of uh, uh, limiting foreign investment in certain areas. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'll, I'll start off a little bit on that. So, hire American, buy American. So, our companies are doing that, right? Our companies are investing here, they're employing Americans. Not only the direct investment, uh, which we talked about over 6 million U.S. workers, 
uh, but indirect. So we did a study that we released uh, last year that showed 24 million Americans around the U.S., which is one in seven in the private sector, have their paychecks due to foreign direct investment. And that's supply chain and then, of course, um, the spending of paychecks beyond that, right? So, so that's really um, significant. Um, an earlier study that we did showed that 79 cents of every dollar spent on inputs from foreign-owned companies is at, from domestic suppliers. So we have to kind of get beyond the rhetoric of higher American, buy American, to think that CGI isn't part of that, to think that Siemens is not part of that. Toyota makes the most American-made vehicle in the United States. 75% of its parts are made in the U.S., which is, you know, blows away um, uh, the uh, domestic uh, companies. So I think we need to rethink of what that means. It's a great soundbite, um, but then to exclude global companies that are here in the U.S. is, is where the, the mistake is, right? And because so many issues are conflated, um, it becomes a problem. But I would just push back and say that's exactly what our member companies um, are doing. In terms of workforce, skilled workforce, it's what uh, drives investment in the United States. Besides the size of our economy and our consumer economy, it's skilled workforce. And because we, we talked about that the compensation is on average 20, 30 percent higher at U.S. subsidiaries, they are looking for advanced um, uh, type of skills. Um, and companies like CGI are trying to deal with that. They're partnering with local uh, community colleges for apprenticeship programs, not only in the manufacturing sector, like companies like Siemens, who are importing um, their apprenticeship programs from Germany, but companies like CGI. Zurich Insurance also is another one that has a, uh, a um, apprenticeship program for white collar workers uh, in Illinois. So um, these companies are taking part in helping to build the workforce of tomorrow in the U.S., which I think is also counterintuitive. Foreign companies here training our workers. Why? Right. So uh, all of these things challenge, I think, traditional definitions of U.S. champions. Right. When we think of U.S. competitiveness, do we think of the competitiveness of Boeing around the world more than we do about Airbus in the United States? Right, So I would argue that our competitiveness should be defined by U.S. workers, the competitiveness of our workers to attract investment from wherever um, uh, that that investment may come. I think it's part of the new dynamic of the 21st century. We can't just place a flag on a company and assume that that company's interest is all in the interest of U.S. workers. We have to actually look what companies are doing uh, for our economy and our workforce. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the the issue around skills is something that we're always dealing with. Um, and, you know, frankly, uh, you know, I spent my time talking about rural, small town America, but it's true just about everywhere, right? Sort of, you know, how you find that that right match. Um, but, I, you know, I would echo what Nancy said, and I would like to think that we're a good example of it, that um, so if you can't necessarily find it, you find a way to help create it. Um, and that is the type of, I mean, when I, I said that is one of the things that any, I mean, any location, um, quite frankly, I think globally, where we would look to site a new software development or other facility is we're going to be looking for a partnership with a two-year or a four-year school so that we can set up curriculum and we can continue to develop that workforce. That's the only way that we're able to do this. Let me just add one uh, just quick point on it. I am, we actually, in the past uh, couple of months, have um, gotten a couple of questions from Chinese government officials about what the U.S. is doing on tax reform. Um, so, you know, I think that other governments are paying attention to what we're doing here. And while the um, higher American, buy American thing is part of it, it really is about whether we have created or are um, improving the investment environment for companies of all shapes and sizes to do business here. So, I think the, the, the multiple policy fronts that could be done that would make the U.S more attractive to foreign investment, be it tax policy rather than trade preferences or something else, are what's going to be driving foreign investment in the United States. Um, and um, so that may mean the Chinese have fewer concerns since tax, tax reform might not be going anyplace, but it's something that I know other governments are looking at as well. 
And then just uh, one more point on the, the skill topic is, you know, as I've mentioned and others underlined, U.S. workers are tremendously highly skilled. That's, that's one of the biggest things that attracts investment. And there have been, you know, a lot of companies like CGI doing a lot to, to work with, with workers and improve skills. But, but that's not something we can take for granted, um, that, you know, the, the U.S. is not necessarily always going to remain the place to come for high-skilled workers if, if we don't invest in education and invest in training and you know doing things to, to keep up with those skills so so that's certainly a very very important point hi i'm um, dan Malinchi with the uh, financial services services committee uh, when the chinese companies contact you to ask about uh, us the future of us tax policy do you explain to them no, it really is as dysfunctional as you're reading about it in the papers. <laughs> um, but my question is a CFIUS question, um, and, and some concerns about the direction that it might be headed in. I note that um, during his confirmation hearings, um, Mnuchin was asked about CFIUS, and in, in response, in part, he said that um, he would ensure that it plays its role in protecting American workers. And I thought, oh, he got that wrong. He doesn't understand CFIUS. But then I thought, no, actually, he may be doing, he may know exactly what he's doing, which is the possibility that CFIUS may be drawn into like a trade war with China um, and used for protectionist purposes. Um, but you made the case that uh, foreign direct investment creates jobs. So would that, be, would that be a problem if suddenly there was some sort of calculus about job creation versus job loss? Do you feel confident that, I think you would think you would, and I probably would agree, uh, on net, we, we benefit from job creation more than job loss. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, I guess I would say, hmm, it probably all depends on how the calculation is done. And what my view is might be different of other um, entities that might be involved in the process. Um, in general, the the statute as draft, as written right now, gives the the administration a, a good amount of leeway in determining what falls under its jurisdiction, but it does have to be related to national security. Um, so I make that point first because while the criteria doesn't include job creation in the United States, um, there certainly are other things that the administration could do without requiring a legal challenge that could stem um, foreign investment in a variety of sectors. Um, you know, there's been discussion about whether we should be looking more closely at investment in the semiconductor industry or in artificial intelligence, areas that may not have an immediate impact right now, but that you know it's been suggested that administrations generally should be looking at that more broadly. Um, you know, I part of the thing about CFIUS is that it is um, not transparent, so you don't really know the full factors that go into it. But I think to make that kind of a change and require it to be the basis of an evaluation would require Congress to change its point of view, to change the, the statute. Uh, I would just add a couple things uh, on CFIUS. So CFIUS is chaired at the Treasury Department because the assumption is foreign direct investment benefits the economy. But they've got heavy hitters on the national security side, as they should have, right, which have shown that CFIUS is by far not a rubber stamp. And right now, one of the, the changes that, that we are seeing is we have companies from allied countries who are coming under additional scrutiny because of their exposure in China, um, So there, which seems to carry a, a very long tail, uh, if you will. And there is some concern that we might start leaning away from assuming that foreign direct investment is something positive and um, sort of worrying about things that maybe don't need to be worried about. I mean, Smithfield Food went through the CFIUS process when the Chinese company acquired them because they were concerned about food safety. Well, we have agencies that deal with food safety regardless of who owns them. Why did this require an extra CFIUS review, right? CFIUS is supposed to be sort of in that space where no other agency can deal with the issues that come up, right? But we care about the safety of our ham, whether a Chinese company owns it, a French company owns it, or a U.S. company owns it. 
The same when a uh, Chinese company acquired the Waldorf Astoria in New York. It went through the CFIUS process um, because uh, the concern was that a lot of diplomats, including the president, stay at the Waldorf when they come into New York. Well, shouldn't we care about the security of the Waldorf regardless of who owns it? Right? Why did that go through CFIUS? Shouldn't it have gotten a scrub regardless to ensure the safety? So again, sort of looking at a 21st century economy where we're all integrated, um, I think it is important because the concern that the foreigners are the only ones that are going to do something bad gives us a false sense of security, I think, in terms of some other things that may happen, right? And, and it does hurt our economy. So that's why CFIUS is headed up by Treasury, so that there is this counterbalance to just looking at national security, which of course should trump everything, you know, um, pun intended. And, um, but, you know, we talked about all of the different benefits. Even mergers and acquisitions raise the game of our industry standards across lots of key economic indicators w when it's M&A. And sometimes the technology transfer is inbound, not always outbound. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I mean, the point you make about Mnuchin's comments, like that, that's something you would only hear at the federal government level. You would never hear that at state and local levels. To, to, yeah, well, and but you know, to echo sort of points that were made earlier, that you know, at the state and local level, it's just taken for granted. I mean, the, these are hugely beneficial for local communities. That the foreign investment in the U.S. creates jobs, that it, you know, it seems preposterous to say, well, we're going to examine these because we think they might somehow be, be taking away jobs. Um, but comments like that, I think, um, unfortunately, do, do have effects. I, I found that when I was um, actually in China meeting with some of the, the state and local agencies that were there trying to encourage foreign direct investment in their state and local areas in the U.S., that, you know, one of the, the things that they found is that firms had misperceptions about CFIUS, that they thought it was much more difficult to get through than it actually was, you know, maybe not realizing it only was applying to mergers and acquisitions, not necessarily Greenfield, that, you know, the, and I think, you know, a lot of these misperceptions come from, from some of the cases um, that we've heard about and from, from comments like that. And I guess I'll just abuse my privilege as moderator to make one other point that seems to be lost in the in the CFIUS debate, and that is that if, if CFIUS is too onerous, who loses? It's American innovators. All right, if you can't sell your company to the highest bidder, what does that do to the innovation ecosystem in the United States? That's why people want to come here to invest, because they know that they can sell it to the highest bidder. If that ceases to be the case, the whole innovative ecosystem in the United States could deteriorate. So, okay. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. I'm a member for UNESCO Task Force, not very popular in the United States now, but our focus is to uh, create new jobs in what is called culture and creative industries. It happens China is extremely aggressive. They suggested as a big plan. My question is, there are many other, many trends. One of them, the new Silk Road initiative in China, uh, how does it affect investment in USA, the cooperation with USA, as well as a more global trend, what is called a 2030 Agenda or Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, China decided to be seriously engaged and it's, I don't know if it's regulations or strategy, but still everyone is involved now. Big commitment except local areas or state level. They don't, it's missing link. How will it affect local area in the United States all over the world? So I apologize, maybe it's a very general trend, but how does it affect your work, your thinking? How, what type of adjustment would you advise? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the Silk Road, um, so there's a variety of policies that the Chinese are pursuing that um, are related to it. Kind of the, probably if you start at the highest level, it's, they, they created several years ago the Asian, Investment, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, which the U.S. is not a part of. Then came the One Belt, One Road Initiative. I think we've renamed it now the Belt and Road Initiative, which 
would do infrastructure projects, including in some of the areas that you're that you're talking about. Um, and then within that are the Silk Road and kind of a variety. There's there's one that's land based and one that's that's sea based or something. Like that. Anyway, regardless. Um, in terms of how that impacts cooperation with the United States, Chinese officials have stated repeatedly that One Belt, One Road um, projects will be open equally to domestic and foreign investors. The key is that we don't actually have a whole lot of details on how that will work at this point, because what our understanding is of how the projects will be done is that they'll be done on a country by country and project by project basis. So without overarching rules that say that the projects for the Silk Road or, or One Belt, One Road meet these standards and that you know there are the domestic and foreign companies bid in this manner, um, it could theoretically be subject to whatever the rules might be of Kazakhstan or Thailand or China or wherever else it might be. So we don't really know enough other than to say that the, the public pronouncements of Chinese government officials is they will open it equally to domestic and foreign companies. Um, on the sustainable development goals in China, they, I, I don't know the answer actually, but I'd be happy to give you my card and I can look into it for you. Um, I'm Doug Palmer with Politico. I had a question for Nancy and a question for Aaron. Um, uh, for, for Nancy, um, I guess uh, both President um, Obama and President Bush at some point in their term put out a statement saying the U.S. is open to foreign investment. And I was at a conference recently at the Chamber of Commerce and someone suggested that would be a good idea for, for Trump to do. I just wondered, is there any ongoing effort to persuade the, the administration to put out a statement like that? And are you expecting it anytime soon? And then for Aaron, you talked about the bid negotiations being ongoing, but I, so is, is that something you've heard from the administration that they're that they're continuing the negotiations with the intent of concluding them? In the immortal words of Monty Python, it's not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, our understanding is that they are evaluating whether they want to proceed with it, but but they have not officially been halted. And the answer to your question is it would be fantastic uh, for the president to issue an open investment statement. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm part of the Investment Advisory Council. We met with Secretary Ross. Um, the, this issue didn't, uh, wasn't raised, um, but I know that there are some uh, that are considering it. We're actually working on efforts at the state level to have governors issue open investment statements. As we've talked about here, um, states get it. They are actively out there recruiting. And given the skepticism in Washington for global connections, we thought it would be fantastic for the states and the governors that really get it to issue, to issue themselves some open investment statements. So our focus, uh, which started on that earlier in the year, it, it, that's where that is for right now, and we're having um, some good success with that, and happy to talk to you uh, offline about it. Hey, uh, thank you all for coming. You're all extremely intelligent. Uh, my name is Julian Kyle Lewis. I'm from the American University. And uh, my question is concerning uh, your educational outlook over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, there's a big battle in Congress. A lot of congressmen and senators are extremely angry at the, I think we're looking at $9.2 million, billion dollars uh, cut from our overall education budget. And um, with uh, the need for investment in areas of math and science, which uh, one of y'all mentioned the, the importance of how automated jobs are uh, the wave of the future and that we can't stop it. And that's just gonna be an ever growing prospect that a lot of Americans are gonna have to deal with, you know, especially in the heartland of the United States where a lot of people live very simple lives and aren't really thinking about, you know, well, I need to learn how to code. I need to go to college and major in chemistry, architecture, uh, computer science, physics, things like that. So I'm wondering, uh, what, what, what are y'all preparing for and what are you expecting as you prepare to pull from these uh, pool of job applicants over the next 10 to 15 years, given the $9.2 billion cuts to our overall education program? Thank you. Well, I'll go first since I think I was the one uh, talking about automation. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate the question and I'll confess, I don't know the details of the cut or proposed cut that you're that you're talking about but 
I will say, um, you know, point taken in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, this is one of the things that we've looked at in the locations where we have facilities and certainly in places where we're looking at additional investments that, yes, we partner with universities, community colleges, but we're now actually developing STEM programs to take into the high school level. And I would imagine we would go, you know, at some point down to the to the um, elementary level as well um, to try to do just that. I'm also hopeful that in some of these communities where we've been for now 8, 10, 12 years, that we're going to be there another 10, 12, 15 years from now. And I don't begin to suggest that it's going to be um, akin to, uh, you know, a family that has had generations of coal miners or whatever it might be. But I'd like to think that we're at least able to foster a culture where that's something that's seen as a good path forward to a kid that's starting out in school. They have an uncle that works. Um, I was just for a meeting in an office here I, uh, a little bit earlier this morning. I passed my card um, to the person working the front desk. Said, "Oh yeah, my my uh, my good friend works for you guys in Lafayette. You know, loves it there. I'm hopeful that there's, you know, that if you do enough of this, it starts to um, it starts to spread and people start to see it as an as an opportunity. And then they do start asking questions about, well, okay, what do I need to do to be prepared to have a job like this? Uh, and then hopefully we're there to do that. But certainly we'll be." Um, you know, this is one of the things that as we're talking with our partners at the state government level, municipal government level, this is one of the things that we'll certainly be talking with them about as a way to ensure that, um, you know, we're, we continue to have that pipeline of talent and it, this is something that, that, uh, that continues to be a, an attractive path for, for people in school coming out of school. Does that get at your question? Okay, okay. I would just uh, add on to what Nicholas said that, I mean, dollars are important, dollars of investment are important, but it's about the, the smarts of where those dollars go. And by companies uh, like CGI partnering with local community colleges, then there's more assurance that the jobs that will be needed can be filled, right? Because if there's not that partnership with business to understand where the jobs of tomorrow are going to be, then you could spend all the money in the world and it, it'll be fruitless. You have three kids in college right now, and you know I'm just, you know <laughs> crossing fingers and and hoping myself, right? And because they've got like an awesome mom, I know that I've <laughs> steered them in absolutely the right direction. But so it's not just about I wouldn't just look at dollars. You know we can spend more money per student, but that doesn't mean we're training them for tomorrow, right? You got to look at how is that training ensuring us that those people will have the skills that are actually needed. So I would look beyond just the dollars and look to see locally how uh, high schools, elementary schools, colleges, community colleges are partnering with the private sector to ensure they're training them in the right way, not just dumping a lot of money. I mean, the kids my kids, the classes my kids sat through in high school in Fairfax County, which is one of the wealthiest counties, was ridiculous. I mean, you know, one of my kids took a criminal justice class and they watched those Sandra Bullock movies uh, when she was a cop. I mean, you know, and this is in one of the richest counties in the country. So it's not just about dollars spent, it's how are they being spent wisely. Um, this question is probably mostly for Aaron, but also anyone else who wants to comment. Um, you mentioned statutory requir requirements to change things in statute for CFIUS. Um, some of the concerns that are floating around, um, a lot of them have to do with like early stage VC investment um, and you know, you know other non-traditional, other than merger and acquisition um, activity, um, particularly in Silicon Valley. And I was wondering if you think, um, my reading of the statute is that for the most part, if it meets the threshold hold for control, CFIUS can w and will look at it. Um, but I was wondering if you see any particular shortfalls there or if that this is, you know, kind of a valid concern um, just because this is something that we've been hearing a lot of concerns about. And then also um, if other th aside from that concern, if you think any of the reform um, proposals and any are there any particular gaps that you see um, could benefit from statutory or otherwise changes? Sorry, Christine Johnson with Senate Banking. Yeah, so um, this is probably beyond my expertise to give you a, a legal analysis of kind of where the holes are. I would say that I think it's an interesting point to think through whether um, how you might um, attempt even to cover venture capital investment um, as part of CFIUS 
because I mean, is that a venture capital firm isn't probably investing just in a, in single firms? That obviously, as, as the nature of what they do, business, they're investing in a variety of areas. Um, and I don't know exactly how how you, how the. I guess I would say, as a layperson, it seems like it's not clear to me exactly how it's covered. But I think that it probably is something that's worthwhile for for um, for investment lawyers and, and folks who have those concerns to think through it. In terms of where other areas might be that would be um, of interest, you know, I think if we're going to look at the statute, we need to make sure there's some balance in how we view these things. The point behind the statute is to genuinely identify national security concerns. Um, we may or may not do that very well right now in terms of being forward thinking about where the risks are coming from, and so that may um, be a, a wise place to put some consideration without necessarily um, predetermining that a change in the statute is going to be the best way to, to change that as much as does the existing authority allow you to get at that right now. I would, I would just add that, um, first of all, when you say a lot of people are talking about, so I'd want to see where was the problem we're trying to solve. And I haven't heard that yet. I've heard exactly what you've just said. Um, so I'd want to see where, where the problem was to be able to figure out what the best solution is. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, as, as Aaron said, <clears throat> CFIUS is supposed to be review those deals where there's control, right? And there's a reason that it was control, right? To be able to exert some sort of control. Um, and so uh, I'm skeptical. Uh, I mean, I've heard about some of the, the initiatives that are in the work. So I, I want to see some of the, the, the details, of course, about it. But again, trying to get to what their pro that problem is. And Aaron's absolutely right. The national security issues of today can be very different from tomorrow, which is why historically national security has been left undefined, right? To some extent, foreign companies want it more defined so they know, okay, we'll just avoid those industries. But we can't design it that way because something that is highly sensitive now, you know, five years from now or two years from now, it's not sensitive at all. Everyone's got the technology as opposed to something that we haven't even thought of yet. So it's deliberately um, left undefined. One last question. Hello, my name is Jonathan Canfield and I'm affiliated with the US Asia Institute. I have two questions. The first one, um, kind of for Aaron, do you think there's any advantages to adopting the Chinese model of special economic zones, these uh, coast cities that have these uh, economic and business incentives to attract foreign direct investment and hold um, companies uh, inside uh, domestically? And then my second question is um, kind of more open to the group is, uh, your company's focus on bringing uh, foreign foreign direct investment into the US, but why not focus on unlocking Asia? You have some of the world's largest economies and uh, a lot of new opportunities, and I think that's where the future is going to be. So I'm curious to hear maybe contrary arguments or support for that. Um, I'll just give a quick answer on the special economic zones. I, I don't know that the model is necessarily one that works for the United States in, in general, for those of you who don't know what a special economic zone is. Um, these are areas where China pilots liberalizations and foreign investment to try to incentivize companies in particular sectors or um, in um, geographic areas that they want to develop more jobs. Um, in general, we've got a pretty open investment environment. So what we would have to do, I guess the rough equivalent if the United States were to attempt it would be to create significant investment incentives for particular companies that would probably have to be tax benefits, land, um, concessions, those kinds of things, which is pretty much what state and local governments do. So I think uh, I think the model is not the right one. Um, you know, I, I will just come back to a point that I think it was that Nancy made earlier that the the U.S. federal government can't pick winners or losers on this front. Um, we have to treat all 50 states equally. Um, there are certainly things that we could do that could make it easier for foreign investors, like even just coming up with a searchable database of all 50 states' investment opportunities. But, um, but probably a specific program to, pr to promote it probably wouldn't be the right fit. 
and I should say that you know those incentives are offered to both domestic companies and foreign companies, and I don't think it would be right to offer more to foreign-owned companies than domestic companies for sure. Uh, and I'm not really sure of your second question. So we represent the U.S. operations of these companies. So we work with the executives at uh, Nicholas's companies here in the United States, and our role is to make the U.S. the most competitive location to employ workers and all of our children um, – uh, again, obviously, my mind is focused on employing children. Um, so, you know, that's what our goal is here. But certainly the companies um, have global strategies that they, they are looking to expand in Asia and other, other places. Great. Well, I hope you will join me in thanking this uh, very distinguished and excellent panel. Thank you. Uh, remember, you can find... Uh, the video of this at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy website, and uh, we're adjourned. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>